So the first thing I want to say is that ADHD is a huge problem. It is growing and growing. So these are the numbers um, through 2016. Um, I think after the pandemic, we're going to even see higher and higher numbers of people who are worried about ADHD. These numbers are also um, for kids only and don't include adults, which is another fast growing area of ADHD diagnosis. So in the numbers, um, you know, we're talking about a 6 million people, um, kids, uh, who have ADHD ranging from little guys um, to uh, teenagers. So these are millions and millions of people, especially um, traditionally boys have been diagnosed more. Big problem in other words. So, um, you know, these people with the big ADHD problem also have other problems too. They have sleep disorders. They're more likely to have anxiety and depression. They may act out or not know how to act and so have social skills issues. There's a significant overlap with autism. They have headaches. They may not eat well. And the ones who are hyperactive tend to have more concussions and injuries. What I'm trying to say is that this is affecting so many people and in so many ways, you would think that the medical system would be set up for this. You'd think there would be an army of people devoted to helping people with ADHD. But oftentimes, unfortunately, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like the opposite. Parents are looking for help and not, know, not knowing where to find it. Um, the kinds of people who could be helpful for both diagnosis and treatment include MDs, so doctors like me, because at least 60% of kids take medicine for ADHD. About half get behavioral therapy, and so they may also go see psychologists or other kinds of therapists. And many need and get school support, and that's done through their individual schools, but there are educational advocates. So I'm gonna take these um, groups of people who work with ADHD, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. Doctors, MDs, people with medical degrees who have gone through medical school. What kinds of doctors might you see if you have ADHD? Well, one kind of doctor is a psychiatrist. Um, another kind of doctor might be a neurologist like me. However, I'm kind of exceptional in that most neurologists do not do ADHD. Um, a third kind of doctor you may see would be a developmental pediatrician. This would be a pediatrician who specializes in behavioral problems or neurodevelopmental issues such as autism, ADHD, or other areas. Finally, there could be your family practice doctor or your pediatrician. That person may be the point person for um, for you in from the medical world. Now, many times um, you will have a diagnosis using rating scales or structured interviews. So even though ADHD is an organic thing, meaning it comes from your brain, there are no medical tests that this you know, that will show this. There's no MRI scan, there's no CAT scan, there's no blood tests that show ADHD. So you might go to your doctor looking for something like, oh my gosh, I need a scan. But no matter what kind of doctor you go to, any of these categories, that's not how they will diagnose ADHD. Um, now, psychiatrists are the ones that most, per, most often would prescribe medicine. But some family practice doctors, you know, it's hard to find a psychiatrist in your area. Um, you may not have developmental pediatricians in your area. Um, so sometimes it might be your family doctor, sometimes it might be a psychiatrist, sometimes it might be a developmental pediatrician, but sometimes your doctor, any of those would say, you know, 
I don't treat ADHD or I don't prescribe medicine for this. And that's true even of the psychiatrists who you'd expect to do this. But the reason why a doctor might not be prescribing medicine are several fold. Many actually have not received training in ADHD. So this is an outpatient pro problem mainly, and a lot of doctor training is done in the hospital. So even psychiatrists who deal with how people think and ADHD definitely fits under that category, even they may not have received adequate training in ADHD. Um, as you all know that there can be a stigma um, which is historical associated with this diagnosis and some people you know will go with the old um, feeling that this is just bad behavior or bad parenting. Um, the usual medications are controlled substances and they can be abused so some doctors feel like they don't want to get into that. Um, of course, most people don't abuse them, but it is kind of an added layer of difficulty as a prescribing doctor to deal with controlled substances. Um, now, you know, here's another point that I wanted you to know. Um, many people go to a psychiatrist uh, asking or expecting that the psychiatrist will do like psychotherapy, meaning asking you know, about your child's motivations and meeting with them every week to see how things are going. I wanted to let you know that many, certainly most in my area, but um, you know, many, many psychiatrists do not do therapy. They may do the medication management, but they don't do the actual talk therapy. And that's for a variety of reasons, including financial. And some people will therefore have a psychiatrist for the medication and a psychologist or a therapist. And sometimes those two people are in the same office, but sometimes they are completely unconnected and you have to kind of find a way to work with both of them. So therapists or counselors, this is for what we would call talk therapists or talk therapy. Again, you'll find a variety of people who do this. Some are PhDs, so they go through graduate school, they get a PhD, they are called Dr. So-and-so, um, but other people have di um, different degrees. Some are marriage and family therapists, some are LCSW, which is a social worker, some are school counselors, and of course some are ADHD coaches. This is a growing area where they may not have any of the above degrees. They may or may not be certified because there are certifications that they could get, but they don't have to. But um, they are promoting themselves as ADHD coaches and some of them very good. So um, in general, I would say the degree is not as important as the person. Um, in my book, ADHD and the Focus Mind, there's a section about how to pick the perfect coach um, and what to look for, but that's a whole other talk. I also would like to point out that there are more and more counselors at schools, which is great, but that's only during the school year. Come May or June, they're out for the summer too. At least that is the case in most school districts. So. Um, in terms of the therapists or counselors, some can make the diagnosis like PhDs, but they don't prescribe the medicine. One thing they can be is they can meet with you more often than medical doctors usually can, and that's, that's good to know. You may have heard of neuropsych testing or educational testing. So there's a very specialized kind of psychologist who does like IQ testing or tests for learning disabilities. They may do some specialized in-office tests for ADHD, and they may do rating scales for anxiety or depression. So people always are asking me, do I need this? And most of the time, the answer is no. Um, it can be very expensive on the order of, you know, $5,000 or more, or maybe a little less. And it's not totally accurate either. Um, I do recommend this for kids where you're worried about learning disabilities. So even when they're focused, they are having a hard time identifying letters or reading, for example. That would be a good time to look for 
um, this kind of testing, but otherwise mainly you don't need to do that. Um, therapists or counselors can't really increase your attention span in the way that medication can, but they do help you look at different influences on your ability to concentrate. So for example, if your child is on their devices um, trying to do their math homework and do TikTok at the same time, they might talk to them about how that's not a good idea. Um, the therapist will also help you realize what your priorities are and set goals. So the more you can be invested in your goal, the more you can say, okay, this is what I want for myself, the better your focus is. The more it's sort of other people making you do things, the harder it is to focus. So a therapist can help you with goal setting, and in, that includes when you don't meet your goals, how you feel. Finally, a therapist can also help you up when you feel down or worried, and those things depression, anxiety, those can make it harder to focus. And then in terms of educational help, um, I'm just going to make the blanket statement that schools are supposed to help your kid. It doesn't seem to always be the case. Um, uh, in early grade school, I think finding the right teacher for your kid to the say that you can or to the most that you can is helpful. There are some teachers who are just wonderful for kids with ADHD and others who are just not a match. And I have definitely known kids who have been on like medication when they have the bad teacher for them and not on medicine when they have the good teacher. So uh, 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 in early grade school, when your kid is with the teacher seven hours a day, that's really important to have a good match in terms of personality. In later years, especially when your kid starts to get grades, like in sixth grade, that's what happens in our district. Um, you may, it's not right for everybody, but there are specialized programs. One is called a 504, and the other one is called an IEP, or Individual Educational Plan. And the basic difference between those things are that a 504 gives you accommodations such as extra time for tests or that you can turn work in late. Um, An IEP is more like you need special education. You need special classes to help you read or talk or um, similarly. So, um, you know, there are other differences, but if you need, if you feel like your child needs one of those plans, then you can ask your school for help. And most of the time you would talk to the principal and they would help set you up. You would definitely talk to the school district then if your principal isn't helpful. The school may do some sort of educational testing, but the thing is it's not necessarily for the purpose of diagnosing. It doesn't really necessarily answer the question of why is your kid having problems? It's more like, do you qualify for services? Because if you don't qualify for services, then eh, we don't worry about it. Um, usually um, qualifying for services means you're two standard deviations below where you should be, and that's really far down, and most, kid, most parents don't wanna wait till their kids are that far down. Um, I should also mention for educational help, you can work with your school district even if you're in a private school. So um, talk to your school district office if you have any questions. Also, trying to find a teacher or counselor at your school who can help you advocate is really, really helpful. Somebody who you can feel is on your side and who might be a liaison. Some people also work with educational advocates who help them deal with the school district. Um, don't forget that you may have resources in your community. If your child has a great connection with a coach or a clergy person or other trusted adult, that person may be able to help you get your child uh, in a mindset where your child is willing to find help um, so that if your child is kind of surly and rejecting help, somebody who is not you, who you know, who can talk to your child might be helpful. And don't forget the benefits of good sleep, exercise, developing hobbies, and generally having fun. Those are also help for ADHD. So here's the roadmap. 
here's a situation. You have concerns, but your kids' teachers, you know, don't really have concerns. You want to talk, talk with your child, start with your child's primary care doctor, and they may refer you on to a therapist or a specialist MD. They may advise you to lobby for educational support and may or may not want to prescribe medicines. There may be a situation where your teacher has concerns, but you're like, no, I don't think so. In that case, talk mainly with the school. We're trying to figure out if it's your kid or the teacher. Call a meeting at your child's school called the Student Success Team Meeting. Talk with your child about what's going on. Talk to other parents who have had a teacher for that, or that teacher for their kids. Talk with the principal and then bring it to the office. And then if everybody has concerns, you want to do everything. You want to talk to the school, you want to talk to the child, and you want to make it an appointment with your child's doctor. So you, you had a list of licensed health care providers earlier in your presentation. Can occupational therapists be added to that list? Well, yes, I guess so. I don't think that's a standard part of ADHD. And I don't know that that really helps most people with ADHD. Um, but occupational therapy can help some. Um, there are certainly some uh, what I would call occupational therapy techniques where, for example, at school your child will maybe get a special chair that allows them to wiggle if they are wiggly kids or, or a band at the bottom of the chair to kick if they're so wiggly and they kind of feel like they need to do something. Many times that can be done through the school. Um, I think that occupational therapy could help people who are very, very sensitive in terms of overcoming sensitivity and if that contributes to wiggliness, maybe that would help. I do not think that occupational therapy necessarily improves somebody's attention span particularly. I do think that techniques that keep a kid active are very important and very helpful. A lot of the kids who are hyperactive really have a hard time sitting through the school day. Um, if I were their teacher, I would um, try to get them some standing desks if possible. I would have them pass out papers, run errands to the office, you know, give them a movement break if need be. That helps a lot of kids. Um, I'd say exercise in general is also very helpful. Um, any suggestions for helping the college student find care for ADHD? Yes, so college students are some of my favorite people because I really love seeing them transition and become more independent and more in charge of themselves. In terms of colleges, um, more and more, you know, there are, is efforts by colleges to continue the care that the high schools have uh, given. So I would say up to about 10 years ago, like I don't think I ever wrote a letter for a college student to get accommodations at college. Nobody ever did that. And um, now, you know, every college I think has a disabilities office where they help your child get accommodations as needed. Uh, it's possible that through the workplace, we're going to start seeing more and more requests as ADHD in adults becomes more um, acceptable or a thing. At some point, um, your child is going to need to bring up their game as much as they can, but uh, assuming your child is doing what they can do, it's nice to know that your school's disability office should have some resources, and that includes counseling if your child is also depressed or anxious. Giving your child responsibility for things before they leave for college, so you know how that, you know, like you, you never know till they go, but you know, knowing that they're a good bet to do well before they leave um, involves giving them as much responsibility as possible for their lives before they go to college. Okay, I have a, looks like a mom who says my 17 year old refuses to talk to therapists. Would an ADHD coach be helpful in this situation? It could be. I don't know all the particulars of your 17-year-old or what led him to that. Many kids will come in and say, I hate therapists. Like, oh, have you met every single one in the world? 
Do you hate the ones you haven't met yet? But if that doesn't work, you can point out that a therapist is a coach. Now, your 17-year-old may have had success in athletics and so may be used to coaching. So if you say, well, you know, the therapist is really a coach, they might perk up their ears a little bit more. If you can get them an ADHD coach that you like and that's more acceptable to your child, even though there's no like real difference in what they do, um, that might be helpful. Um, in terms of, you know, talking to surly 17 year olds, sometimes you have to point out that what they're doing isn't working and let me know when you have a good plan. And if they can't come up with it, that's not good. If a kid has a lot of anxiety or depression, they may not be thinking very clearly about, you know, their, um, uh, you know, their own situation. We're not good observers of our own situation. So, um, you know, I'd say if your 17 year old has any sort of athletic background, you might use that. Why do you think ADHD is growing and why would the pandemic increase it? Those are good questions. Why do I think it's growing is partly because people are more willing to get diagnoses. So, you know, like 30 years ago, you didn't want your child to have a diagnosis. That was embarrassing and that was a reflection on you. Now you get services at school and it's much more acceptable to talk about it. So that's part of it. I also think that our electronic age where everything is faster paced, there are so many more distractions because everywhere you look, there's electronic distractions. That plays a role. The more you do, um, you know, uh, what I call recreational screens, Instagram, TikTok, you're used to doing things in like 30 seconds blurps and um, you can swipe if you don't like it. So thinking in a recreational screen type of way, uh, often, does bad things for your attention span. Even somebody with a good attention span seems to have less of an attention span after they've been on screens for a long time. And many of these kids are doing recreational screens for on the neighborhood of eight hours a day. If you do anything for eight hours a day, it trains you to think in that way. And, you know, if they're always seeing really good looking people who are on Instagram and saying all these cute things, they're not, it seems real to them, but they're not seeing the makeup, the rehearsals, the lighting, all that stuff. And it's sort of like having a diet full of sugar. If you only eat sugar things or only eat spicy things and then go eat an apple, you're like, ew. What is this? It's boring. And and that's like they go from Instagram to chemistry class and, um, you know, they find chemistry class boring and then they have a harder time concentrating. Um, in terms of why after the pandemic, partly it's because parents are watching their kids. Everyone's home together and they're seeing their kid like all over the place. Um, and part of it is that the screens have just been more and more available. Finding a therapist is extremely difficult due to availability. So the mom is curious as to any advice you have on finding a good match. Yes, it's terribly hard to find a therapist. That's a, a nationwide problem. And again, with the pandemic, it's been particularly worse because not only do you have ADHD, you have lots of people getting depressed and anxious and off their game. Um, I always tell people, you have got to call in the neighborhood of 50 people. You will get five of them will call you back. So it's not like you're gonna be fielding 50 phone calls. Like if you call 50, I think five will call you back and then you can work it out with them. Um, finding good ones, you would ask uh, friends, family, you would ask your child's doctor. You also may care whether the insurance is gonna pay. So you have to kind of scour your list of people you've heard are good and cross-reference that with people who your insurance covers. Hopefully there will be something that intersects. Sometimes it's a matter of just trying someone and see. But if you can get somebody, you need to know that that is you know, worthwhile. Okay, I have a mom. It looks like, okay, her son is seven years old. He's mm -hmm. been diagnosed with ADHD and they are on their third week of medication. 
she is wondering, she would like to skip medicine on the weekends, the days where he's not in school. It looks like there's some issues with eating. That's not quite clear to me. But her question is, is there any disadvantage to skipping the medicine on the weekend, particularly because he's not in school on those days? Yeah, so you know, your your the mom would uh, certainly want to um, talk to their provider about what their provider recommends. When I see people here, if they are on the stimulant medicines, and those are things like Adderall and Ritalin and Vyvanse and Focalin, they all have different names. Um, but uh, if he's if you know, if you're on a stimulant medicine, those medicines work for the day. So if you take them on a Monday, they work for Monday. If you don't take them on a Tuesday, they will not work. Must be taken internally to work, by the way. So, um, uh, you know, if she doesn't need it on the weekends, I am fine with it. There's no medical reason why they would want to do it. And if the child isn't eating so well during the week because of the stimulant medicines, then I would probably actively encourage them to feed the child up at breakfast and on the weekends so that we get some good nutrition in. Thank you for joining us today. This will conclude this evening's webcast.